Hi, I'm Ranger Mara at Shenandoah National Park. On a cold winter day like today, when there might even be a flurry or two in the air, you can still hike on the trails here in Shenandoah National Park. You just need to use a little more caution. Uh, you want to make sure you have your layers on. And like I do, I've got my sweater underneath, I've got my gloves on, got my fleece hat on, and uh, ready to go. Um, but one of the trails that's uh, an easy trail, one of the easiest trails in the park, in fact, is the Limberloss. That's where we are today. And I'd like to take you on a little exploration of this short trail. It's just uh, over a mile, but it's uh, one of our wheelchair accessible trails. It's the only wheelchair accessible trail in the park. It's got a crushed greenstone surface. There are benches scattered throughout the, the loop, so you have lots of places to, um, to stop and rest. And if you are in a wheelchair, there are places that you can pull over and just listen and watch and see what's going on on a winter's day like this. This trail also has a lot to see, um, including a, an unusual rock formation, some remnants of an ancient hemlock forest, a new forest coming in all around you, and an unusual wetland habitat with some uncommon to rare plant species. So if you're ready, let's take a look. This is a really cool geologic formation right here on the Limberlost Trail. It's called columnar jointing and it was formed millions of years ago when magma, hot magma underneath the surface of the earth, came up and extruded through cracks along the surface of the earth. It came out in long sheets, miles long and very thick, and eventually cooled. Sometimes the extruding magma cooled so quickly that it formed five or six sided polygon shapes and that's what we're seeing right here and we call that columnar jointing. There are many examples of this throughout the park, some much larger than this, but this is one of the most easily accessible uh, formations of columnar jointing that you can see. This basalt, very hard, dense rock, um, doesn't let water go through it like a softer sedimentary rock like sandstone or, or limestone. And so as a result, when rain melt, rainwater or snow melt goes down through the soil and hits that, ba that rock underlying, uh, underneath the surface, um, it doesn't have anywhere to go. And so it will pool right there and form a seepage area um, or a spring will pop out of the water and that water will find its way downward um, with, as, as gravity pulls it and, and form a stream here in Shenandoah National Park. So great example of this very tough uh, basalt, metabasalt actually, that we call greenstone here along the Limberlost Trail. And remember the surface that you're walking on is crushed greenstone. And you can really see that blue-green color when it's, it's crushed and you're walking on it. What we see here is a remnant of an ancient hemlock forest. This was one of the largest groves of, of hemlocks that we knew of here in Shenandoah National Park. And some of these trees were 250 to 300 years old before they died. They were here in a large grove, about 25 acres uh, worth of, of hemlocks here. This was perfect habitat for them. And I'm using past tense because the hemlocks are on the ground now. And that's because of uh, an, an exotic insect called the hemlock woolly adelgid that uh, came in and uh, would suck the sap out of the needles of the hemlocks without their needles. That's like the leaves on a hardwood tree. Without the needles, they can't make food and the trees died. And these trees were uh, some of the largest trees in the park and as, as I said, some of the oldest known trees in the park. So what happens when a, a big forest like that changes suddenly? You have a lot of openings in the forest and the big old trees uh, are on the ground. They will eventually help to renew the soil. But now you've got a big open space where before was forest. So that's going to be a big change for the animals living, living here. The trees, however, nature is never idle. 
and nature fills in a void. And we were ha interested to see what happened when the hemlocks uh, died back, what would come in to replace them. And what we're seeing are right here. These are birch trees. This is black birch, but also yellow birch uh, saplings. Seedlings came in and have filled out this whole open space where hemlocks used to be. So this is a birch forest now in the making. Eventually, these smaller saplings will be shaded out by the, the sturdier, larger trees, and you'll have a more open forest. But right now, all of these little saplings are competing for that sunlight. What's also kind of cool, as much as we hate to see the hemlocks disappear, we've lost about 90% of the hemlocks here in Shenandoah National Park. On the other hand, the openings that they've created um, have allowed other trees to, to um, uh, more space to, to grow and thrive. One of those trees is the um, red spruce. It's a rare tree in Shenandoah, and it's only found at the higher elevations. So here at Limberlost, Stony Man Mountain, Hawksbill Mountain, Big Meadows area. And you see a lot of saplings of red spruce trees also taking advantage of the sudden opening here in the forest. So the death of one tree is helping to bring about some new life for th some other species. I'm standing on a bridge over a stream that starts right here in the Limberloss. This is one of three of the headwaters of White Oak Canyon. And that's a beautiful ravine where you have a chance to see six different waterfalls on the way down. Remember that greenstone we just looked at back there, that wonderful formation of very dense, hard, uh, metabasaltic, uh, metamorphosed uh, rock, very tough doesn't let the water trickle through it, so the water that comes up off out of the surface of the ground right here has to, to travel across that rock and over it since it can't get through it. And of course, gravity is pulling it uh, downward. The angle of the land is tilted down, and so it cascades down over this very harsh, harsh, <laughs> and I shouldn't say harsh, very hard uh, and dense greenstone rock. So we have that greenstone rock underneath our surface to thank for some of the most beautiful spots, scenic spots here in Shenandoah National Park, our waterfalls. Some of the other trees that you'll find here in the Limberlost, in addition to the old fallen hemlocks, are trees that were growing up here with them whenever they could catch some sunlight and those include oaks and maples and uh, some white pines. And we have one right here that's a really interesting looking tree because most of the way up the trunk there are no branches. And that uh, tells us the story that this white pine was growing among all of those thick, uh, shady um, hemlock trees. And so those lower branches didn't get sunlight and they were shaded out and eventually fell off. So the tree's top made it above the hemlocks and was able to break into the sunlight and the tree continued to grow above the height of the hemlock trees. And that's why you have this unusual looking white pine here. There are several of them that look that way that only have branches a little farther than halfway up the trunk. We're on a short section of boardwalk here on the Limberlost Trail, and that boardwalk is needed because the area right here is a, uh, an unusual kind of a habitat. It's a swampy, swampy section of, of land here, and that's part of how the Limberlost got its name. Uh, George and Addie Pollock, who owned the Skyland Resort, just a half a mile or so away from here on the other side of Skyline Drive, starting in the 1890s all the way up to the 1930s uh, when Shenandoah National Park came in. Uh, when they were here, there was a popular series of books by Gene Stratton Porter, uh, starting with Freckles uh, in 1904 and Girl of the Limberlost in 1909, and they both featured a, a fictional uh, place called the Limberlost Swamp. 
and it was a place where these characters lived. And the Pollocks thought that would be the perfect name for this swampy section of land uh, close to their resort with these giant hemlock trees. And uh, so they named it about 100 years ago. And then uh, shortly after that, there was uh, a logging operation that was going on, and this land was not owned by the Pollocks. And um, they were concerned that the big giant hemlock trees were going to be cut down uh, for timber. And so Addie Pollock uh, paid $10 per tree for the 100, 100 of the largest hemlock trees. She purchased the logging rights to those specific trees. And in so doing, she was able to preserve the, the biggest, oldest uh, trees in the hemlock grove for another hundred years uh, before this little uh, hemlock woolly adelgid bug uh, took them out. So uh, that's the story of the, how the Limberlost got its name. The boardwalk that we just came across was needed because of this formation, this slow-moving seepage area that comes from a spring right here in the middle of the Limberlost and that's what forms the swamp land and that fresh spring water is important to a lot of wildlife like uh, bobcats, bears, deer. We see those here along the Limberlost as well as uh, bird species that are migrating through our warblers in the springtime or other birds that uh, uh, nest here and breed here throughout the season. Um, as well, this, this habitat is um, perfect for mosses and ferns and some rare plants in the park, such as the speckled alder uh, shrub, which only grows in a few places in, in the park. It's a state rare uh, shrub. So the seepage area, very important. But this was also this spring area. Springs were used by people who lived up here in the mountains um, before the park came in. And there were homes in this area. So people would have a spring box where they would stop the water, dam it up a little bit, build a box around it, and that's where they would store their uh, milk and cream and butter, things like that, before there, uh, there were refrigerators around. So the springs, the water, very important to all of the life in this area, including people. Some of the plants here in the Limberlost are ones that were put here by people. For instance, the apple tree that uh, we're looking at right here, there are quite a few of them here in the, the Limberlost uh, area. Some of them go back 100 years or more. Uh, they were planted by people who lived in the area before the park came in, but they still uh, produce apples uh, uh, every year. Not every year, maybe every other year. They have a good year and an off year. A variety, di different varieties of apples that you won't find in the grocery stores today. Things like uh, Milam apples, uh, Grimes golden black twig. Those uh, varieties are, are called heritage uh, uh, species. You can still find them uh, at uh, farm markets uh, around the valley. But uh, 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 here in the park, there are thousands of apple trees still uh, throughout the woods that have been planted long ago by people. Now, uh, bears will, will climb these trees in the fall and they will be up there uh, eating those apples and the deer love the ones that have fallen uh, to the ground or that just might be within their reach. So look for, for apple trees the next time you're here uh, in the winter or fall. If you don't see wildlife while you're hiking on the uh, Limberlost Trail, you might see evidence that they were here. For example, on this tree, you may see some scratch marks up here. These were made by a bear, and that's a bear's calling card. That bear is saying, I was here scratching that tree and saying to any other bear, you know, are you this tall? If not, you probably want to go elsewhere. So a bear's calling card. They'll often choose a tree that's got thin bark. And this is a black birch uh, tree. So you can easily see those scratch marks. These have been here for quite a while. So this tree has, has healed over those old uh, uh, bear mark uh, scars. But if you look, um, look closely at the trees and you may see some evidence that uh, animals are leaving their calling cards. Even though the giant old hemlock trees are no longer here, you can still see some very large uh, specimens of other species here, including this red oak right behind me. Uh, well over 100 years, as we can tell by counting the rings on this part 
that was cut quite a while ago. Uh, this tree has been around so long that some branches are, you know, have died and are and have decayed, and there's some holes in it uh, as uh, fungus and bacteria start to, to work on some some uh, injuries where where that uh, bark was injured long ago. And that's okay. That's part of the way the forest uh, grows and eventually dies and returns to the soil on the ground. In the meantime, those decaying places, those holes are important uh, home sites or potential home sites for wildlife including bears and raccoons and owls like the barred owl. Barred owl is one of the largest owls uh, species here in the park and they'll be about that high, over a foot high. They've got a rounded head and, and dark brown eyes and they nest here in the Limberlost area. So they will nest in, in a hole and those soft fungus created holes are, are important for, for them for nesting. So whenever you, you hear that um, animals need an old growth forest, that's one of the reasons because think about a barred owl family try, trying to raise a family in this young birch forest with the, the, the trees only this big around, even though they're 20, 25 feet tall, they can't support a nest for barred owls. And so barred owls depend on old growth forest because that's where the trees are big enough to, for them to have a home in. So even as trees begin to, to fade away, they're important to the whole life of the ecosystem here. So take a look at our big trees whenever you come through the Limberlost here and appreciate the fact that they might not be around forever, but they're part of a process of renewing life uh, every day. We talked about the old giant hemlocks um, being killed off and, and going away and that's incredibly sad. Um, on the other hand, uh, nature keeps trying to renew itself and the hemlocks are not gone. Um, we're still trying to fight this hemlock woolly adelgid by injecting, doing soil injections of pesticides around the base of uh, larger hemlock trees that uh, will take up this pesticide into their systems and then the insects, as they suck the, the, the needles, they'll be actually sucking up that pesticide and it, and it kills them. So this is a pretty labor intensive uh, operation. Um, we're able to you know, get to a couple thousand trees uh, a year and then those applications are repeated every, about every five years or so. Um, but we can't get to all of the hemlocks. But in the meantime, the hemlock uh, uh, cones keep dropping and young hemlock saplings are, are found throughout the park, like this one right here. This one's over seven feet tall. And, um, and it's, it's our you know, hope for the next generation if there ever is a, a way that, that hemlocks can be a rid of the hemlock woolly adelgid these young ones will, will take up the, the story after them. It will be quite a while before we have our hemlock groves back again, if that is what happens. But in the meantime, there's hope and young saplings here in the, the National Park for you to see. Well, we're walking through a virtual forest of mountain laurel. This is one of the prettiest blooming shrubs in the park. The flowers are large. They're about the size of a, a nickel and uh, very kind of uh, geometric shape, very pretty flowers. But uh, you're not going to see them blooming in the winter time. Uh, if you want to see these guys blooming, uh, June is a better time. Our mountain laurels tend to start blooming around the end of May and continue on through June, depending on the elevation, of course. they'll. They'll bloom a little earlier, a little bit lower elevation, and then uh, uh, the last ones will be up here at the higher places, like the Limberlost. So just imagine on a good bloom year, um, both sides of this Limberlost trail being covered with mountain laurel blossoms. It can be quite, quite majestic. As I mentioned at the start of our hike, the Limberlost Trail is one of our easiest uh, trails in the park. 
only 1.3 miles and it's a circuit, it's a loop around. So uh, it's good for wheelchair uh, accessibility, but also it's a great starter, starter hike if you've never hiked in the park and you're looking for something uh, pretty gentle or if you have young kids. Um, this is also a track trail. Track trails are a system of hiking trails throughout the eastern U.S. that are sponsored by a group called kidsandparks.com. And we have three track trails in the park. Each track trail has a brochure that offers some activities for kids, and it kind of just gives them a little bit of something to do when they're hiking along, kind of to keep their interest going. Um, and then whenever you're finished with your track trail hike, you can go to the website if you choose and tell them which track trail you hiked and you get points. And for the more points you get, they send you different things like stickers and things like that. The other two track trails in the park are at Fox Hollow up by Dickey Ridge Visitor Center. That is at uh, mile four and a half roughly and that's got its own brochure. And then the third one is in the South District of the park, uh, down by Black Rock. That's the trail that is used for that one. And you get to hike on part of the Appalachian Trail for that. And uh, that's around mile 85 in the South District. If you're looking for a fun trail to do with young kids, um, think about Limber Lost and the other track trails as a, a first trail hike. Um, otherwise, you can enjoy the Limber Lost Trail any time of year. It's for all ages and abilities. So uh, thanks for joining me on our hike today on the Limberlost, and I hope to see you again uh, not too distant in the future hiking on one of our trails. This is Ranger Mara at Shenandoah National Park. See ya.